we need to get nutrients, which are building blocks, and we also need to get energy, which is measured in calories. So you can have a diet that is high in calories and low in nutrients. Right. So if you drink a lot of alcohol, if you eat a lot of potato chips, for example, so like beer and potato chips are like your main source of food, then you would have a lot of calories, but you would actually be malnourished because you don't have the appropriate nutrients. Okay. So those are two things to take into consideration when you think about diet and what digestion is all about. So we as animals obviously have to take in the nutrients. We're not capable of building energy. And then we can use some forms of food as energy. And so we'll talk about the different types of, of um, food in a minute. We also have um, what is called intracellular digestion. So if you look at this word, intra means inside, okay? So this is versus extracellular digestion. So we have, as animals, have evolved to have a space inside our body where we secrete enzymes and we digest the food outside of the cell. If you think about sponges, for example, sponges do not have a digestive tract at all. So they only have intracellular digestion. When you think about jellyfish, they're the first ones with a mouth and an anus, it's one opening and they are able to eat larger items of food because they break it down first extracellularly. So that's outside the cell and in a cavity. And so if you think about this, this is quite amazing because I have a stomach that is full of acid, that acid would do damage to my body if it got loose. I also have full of, my digestive tract is full of enzymes that could eat myself from the inside out, right? So that extracellular digestion is quite amazing that it takes place inside my body and I can, you know, digest my own tissues, but I don't, right? I'm digesting the food that I take in. So if we think about um, organisms like the hydra and the jellyfish, they have an incomplete digestive tract. And then when we look at the, this would be like a nematode, a roundworm, we see that they have a complete digestive tract. And the advantage of the complete digestive tract with two openings is, is that we have compartmentalization. So we have different things, different types of digestion, different things happening in different parts. So now we can have a specialized digestive system okay, with complete digestive tract. Okay, so let's look at the human digestive system. So we have, obviously, a mouth or an oral cavity, that's an oral, <laughs> oral, not coral, oral cavity. Okay. So one of the interesting things about our oral cavity compared to like fish or compared to like frogs is this that we actually have our nasal cavity separate from our mouth. So this is actually separated from our nasal cavity. If you are looking at a frog, um, they do not have a separate um, nasal and oral cavity. So they have to breathe and eat the same time. They, they're not separated. So our oral cavity is separated from our nose, which means that we can chew our food and breathe at the same time, okay? So we have, a heterodont dentition. What does that mean? Like right, diversity in teeth. This is um, allows for more efficient mechanical digestion. Digestion. If you ever see things coming out in your feces, 
whole, like peanuts or corn, that means you did not chew your food properly, right? So things can sometimes make it through without getting digested if you don't chew it. Okay, so that's heterodont dentition. We also have um, a tongue. And the tongue is useful because it can manipulate the food. And it creates what is called a food bolus. So this is the old saying that you do not want to inhale your food. Right? You don't want to like breathe in your food because it could potentially get into your respiratory tract and kill you. So you want to manipulate your food. You want to chew it. You want to calmly put it into a bolus, right? And then you want to swallow it. And that food bolus is really important because it pushes down on the epiglottis. There's a mechanical valve and the food bolus pushes down on it and it makes the food go to the right tube. It makes it go into the esophagus and not into the trachea. So I'll show you a diagram of that in a second. So the food bolus is really important that you swallow your food in, in balls, right? Big chunks. Of it. <laughs> okay, the tongue is also um, taste, right? And this not might not play much of a role today because we have you know, the FDA, we have nutritionists creating, you know, food for us that says it's supposed to be healthy, so I, you know, I, I eat it, right? But if you think about in the past when we had to forage, taste was probably really important, right? So that you could taste and you could crave certain nutrients. And so we generally have what is um, salty, considered salty. So that would be minerals like sodium and chloride. So I need sodium in my diet to a limited extent. We have over salted most of our uh, processed foods, however, right? So we get too much salt. So this is sodium and chloride, which are important electrolytes. Those are ions. So that's what makes up salt, sodium and chloride. We also can taste sour. What do you think, um, what vitamin is associated with sourness? Vitamin C. vitamin C, right? Have you ever really craved vitamin C, right? Like, oh, I need some vitamin C, right? And you're just like craving it, right? Could be that you need it. This is a nutrient that we have to have in our diet in order for collagen to be formed in our body, which is important in the skin, it's important in our bones, can lead to scurvy if we do not have vitamin C. Okay. We also have bitter. And bitter is an interesting one because in general, bitter means toxin, right? Because plants produce bitter chemicals to try to prevent herbivory. So most plants, that uh, or produce a chemical so that if you taste it, it could be a toxin and you would spit it out. But caffeine is an example, dark chocolate. We actually start to like the bitter taste because we associate it with influences on our nervous system. So toxins also affect the nervous system, right? So we can crave coffee because it speeds up our, our nervous system, right? It gives us that caffeine high, even though it's bitter. Sour is actually a measure of pH, which is important because pH can affect the way the enzymes work in your mouth. So what happens when you even think about eating a pickle? You salivate, right? And that saliva would actually um, decrease the pH, so it actually neutralizes the pH so that you can still digest that food in your mouth, right? So this is, salivation is just a way to neutralize the pH in your mouth. Is it bitter? Like, doesn't it have some effect on pH as well? Um, I don't really more think so. Like, more things taste bitter. like a base, like sodium hydroxide. Yeah. 
I don't know. But that, yeah, so sour is more acidic. Yeah, I don't know, I have to think about that one. Um, I guess so. baking soda water tastes bitter, kind of. Yeah, okay. And then there is another one that just was recognized. And does anybody, oh, sweet, sorry. Okay. If I'm running low on calories and energy, so this is why, like, if you don't eat all day, you want you want something sweet, right? Because you're like low on energy, so then you're going to eat something sweet. So this is why they say that if you eat regularly, then you may not crave sweet as much. Okay. And then there's one more. Does anybody know what it is? You mommy. You mommy. Okay. Umami is savory, and it is associated with protein, right? So, like, you want a savory steak, right? The problem with this one is it has actually been hijacked by uh, the junk food industry to make you think that you're getting nutrients when you're really not, right? So what is that? What is that chemical that they add to a lot of food? Oops. Does anybody know? Yes, MSG. Monosodium glutamate, MSG. And there's big controversy over whether MSG is bad for you or not, but it can trick your body. So for example, Doritos, right? You're craving something savory. You need some nutrients. You're eating Doritos. Your body thinks your mind thinks you're getting protein. There's no protein in Doritos, right? So you'll just kind of keep eating it and eating it and eating it, and you'll never get the protein, so you'll just keep eating it, right? And so it just kind of hijacks the body's ability to recognize what is protein and what is not, right? So taste is a really important component because it gives us information about the nutrients um, of the food, right? What is in it? Okay. We also have salivary glands. Salivary glands um, release water, right? Water is necessary for chemical reactions to occur in your mouth. Chemical reactions are occurring in your mouth. We have enzymes. And one of these is an enzyme called salivary amylase. Anytime you see this ACE ending, that means that you're looking at an enzyme. Not all enzymes, however, have an ACE ending. So like pepsin is an enzyme in your stomach. It doesn't have the ACE ending, but if it has the ACE ending, it is an enzyme, okay? So salivary amylase is an enzyme that is in your saliva. And we're gonna look at that in a second. We also um, have um, antibodies. And what do you think the antibodies function as? Immune, right? Immunity. So that would be like immunity against bacteria, fungi, stuff that we have been exposed to previously. So we take in a lot of microbes when we eat. It's all over the food, all over our hands. Yep. So do those work like against uh, food allergies? You do not want to produce antibodies to nutrients. So like antibodies to gluten or antibodies to peanuts, you don't want those because that's an allergen and, that, and then your body is acting inappropriately towards them. So these antibodies, I don't think are the ones that uh, are associated with allergies, they're IgA antibodies, it's the IgE antibodies like gluten is a problem, yeah. And do these function against toxins too? Yes. Like, yes. you said immunity, but like you're starting to do Yeah, I'm trying to think of an example of where you would take a, you'd have a known toxin, maybe a bacterial toxins, they would act against those too. Okay, so, yep. What, would, what could cause production if you didn't produce or you weren't allergic to something before, what could cause the sudden production of those antibodies against like gluten? Um that's a, a kind of you know 
We don't quite know the mechanism of that. Um, that one hypothesis that I gave you was is that your immune system doesn't have anything to fight off. So it learns to fight off stuff like the hygiene hypothesis or you know the hookworms actually decrease your reaction to gluten. Might If you had a hookworm, you might not be allergic to peanuts anymore, right? Because your immune system is fighting off other things. So it's the same antibodies that fight off worms that cause the allergic responses to food. Yep, yep. Okay, so we have the salivary glands. So I'm going to give you a little handout, and I want you to read through it. And so you'll read through this first part, and then I want you to answer the questions on the back. And so this is just um, group work to do um, as a little break from lecture. So you can uh, read through it together or alone, separately, and then get together with another person in class and answer the questions. And if you need to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water, I'm also going to give you a handout of the digestive system.
Okay, so what does salivary amylase break down? Starch. Starch. So it breaks down starch into a molecule called maltose. maltose. And maltose is actually a disaccharide. So it's a simpler sugar, so you can actually taste maltose as sweet. So if you've ever um, eaten bread when you were maybe, or maybe even as adults, or as a kid, you know, you hold it in your mouth, and the longer you hold it in your mouth, the sweeter it gets. And the reason for that is, is that starch itself is not sweet. So if you think about eating a piece of um, raw potato, it does not taste sweet. But if you held that piece of raw potato in your mouth long enough, your body would start to break that down into maltose, and it would taste sweet. Okay. And so then where does that maltose go? Into your small intestine. And what other enzymes work on that? Maltase, right? So that's easy to remember. So maltase breaks down maltose into what? Glucose. So glucose is the primary form of energy that we use in our bodies. Okay. What other enzyme do we have there? There's one more. Pancreatic. Pancreatic. So there's actually two glands that produce amylase. The salivary glands and then the pancreas. So the pancreas is a gland that sits right by your stomach, and there's a duct that goes and transports enzymes to your small intestine. So that is any starch that doesn't get broken down, let's say you eat it really fast and it doesn't stay in your mouth very long, by the time then it gets down to your, um, to your small intestine, you can also break down the starch in your small intestine. And then glucose is what is taken up by the individual cells. So we have to have the maltase break it down um, into glucose before the glucose can be taken up intracellularly. Okay. So then we found out that there was a um, particular gene that codes for this amylase, and it's called AMY1, right? And we have a diploid gene copy number. And so what was the range? 2 to 15. And so we can see here that when we look at the number of individuals in each population, so let's look at the European population. So this is European. And so you notice that um, if we look at like eight, eight copies, so this is the proportion of individuals. So about 80% of the population has eight or more copies, okay? So what that suggests is, is that we relied at some point in our past on a diet that was high in starch. So if you compare this to people that were primarily meat eaters that did not rely on starch, then you would predict that they would have a lower number of amylase genes. So we became, you know, farmers and we relied upon potatoes for our nutrients so that we would um, be better able to digest it. But this all, all kind of relies on the fact that you would have to first see whether or not an increased number of, of the copies of the genes actually translates to an increased amount of salivary amylase. So how would you go about number four? What would be an independent variable? Yes, the number of copies would you be your independent variable. So you first test them genetically, right? And then you would look at how much salivary amylase they had. And so that would be your dependent variable. Okay, control variables might include such things as um, you would want to look at um, diet, um, population, you might, oh, I didn't realize you were here, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Diet population, right? Maybe even age. Age might, might affect salivary amylase production. Yes. Did you say the dependent was? The dependent would be the amount of uh, the enzyme. The independent would be the, the gene. So we would say that the amount of enzyme is dependent upon the number of the copies of the gene that they have. Independent copy number? Yes, independent is the number of copies. So if you can digest 
starch better, like if I didn't have any amylase in my body, I would not be able to digest starch at all, right? It would just go through my whole body and I would never be able to get the glucose out of it. Is that when you're sick though? You would probably die because okay, you have to say die. like something would happen. I mean, you wouldn't maybe die, but you would have to eat simple sugars. You could not rely upon complex sugars for your glucose. And you could also convert fat to glucose and other things to glucose. Okay. Any questions about that idea? How our digestive system and our ability to digest is dependent upon um, our uh, past evolution, what we um, depended upon for food. Okay, did everybody get a copy of the handout? Of this handout, yep. Okay. So these are all salivary glands. There's one that is in your cheek, which is the largest one. You don't need to know that. that that's called the parotid gland. And when you have mumps, that is what it gets infected. So that's why when that virus infects the parotid gland, the salivary gland, it causes you to get like chipmunk-like pouches on your face. We all probably know that there's one underneath our tongue. So that's the sublingual one. And then there's one underneath the mandible that can some, you can sometimes feel. There's also lymph nodes underneath here, but that is also the salivary gland. Okay. This is the hard and so soft palate. That separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavity, which means that we can chew and breathe at the same time. And then obviously you see the tongue in there. They don't show the teeth. Okay, so what would this structure be right here? Esophagus. So you can't feel the esophagus, but if you feel the front of your throat, what are you feeling? Trachea. Your trachea. So the trachea actually sits anterior in front of the esophagus. So when we do the dissection of the rat, you're gonna need to pull away the trachea to see the esophagus behind it. So it is posterior. Is that what we're doing in lab this week? I think so, that's what we're gonna probably do. One structure that is not shown here is the structure right here, which sits like a dome above the liver. And what is that structure? Diaphragm. The diaphragm. The back of the throat, before it branches into the esophagus and the trachea, so the back of the throat, right, like right here, has another name. Does anybody know what the back of your throat is called? It is called the pharynx. So the pharynx is actually the common opening. to the digestive and respiratory systems. So if we think about the primitive chordate, they had pharyngeal gill slits. The pharyngeal gills um, captured food particles and also were used in respiration. So the reason why we have this common opening, which is probably not the best system to have, because people every, you know, all the time choke and um, can die from choking when they get stuff into their uh, respiratory system. Um, that's probably not the best way. It's probably better to have separate openings, but that just is the way that we are designed. Sometimes they'll do a tracheotomy where they'll actually cut a hole in the trachea so that you bypass the pharynx so you can breathe right through that opening into the respiratory tract, right? Right, yeah. They get throat cancer, yeah. Sometimes they also get esophageal cancer and have to have the parts of their esophagus removed too. So the esophagus is an interesting structure because it has peristaltic 
movement. So we've seen peristaltic before when we were talking about the movement of the earthworm and its ability to burrow using its hydrostatic skeleton. But this is the alternating contraction and relaxation of the esophagus. So what type of um, tissue probably allows for the peristaltic movement and the pushing the food down your esophagus towards your stomach? Smooth muscle. Is smooth muscle voluntary or involuntary? Involuntary, right? So there's longitudinal and circular, just like muscles, just like with the earthworm, there's longitudinal and circular muscles around our esophagus, and it contracts and relaxes, and it pushes the food down. And you probably have experienced like swallowing a chip before you properly chewed it, and you can feel it scratching, right, as it comes down. And then you might have also experienced swallowing a pill and having it stick in your esophagus. And it kind of drives you crazy because it, what, what you're sensing there is, is that the esophagus is trying to move the pill down and the pill is stuck to the side, right? And it cannot move. And so that's why it feels annoying to you. Um, but that's that peristaltic movement. Okay. So we have here where the esophagus penetrates the diaphragm, we have what is called the gastroesophageal sphincter. Because we want food generally to move unidirectionally through our digestive tract, we do not want to have to regurgitate unless we're vomiting up and it's a toxin that we, our body has sensed, right? So once we swallow, we don't want stuff coming back up the esophagus. So this is a sphincter that aids in that. And it is actually where kind of the, the function, one function of the diaphragm is it actually helps to create that sphincter. Okay. Does that gastroesophageal sphincter work when people that have acid reflux? Right, and so the problem is when you have acid reflux. Right, so you get acid into the esophagus. The esophagus, unlike the stomach, is not protected from acid digestion. And so the big, you know, people say, oh, I have acid reflux, but the big problem with acid reflux is, is that if you have it your entire life, the older they get, the, the more freaked out people get by it, the doctors, right? So um, I had acid reflux, and my doctor told me never to go off my acid reducers. And why is that? Because the longer that you're off your acid reducers, your acid is eating away your esophagus. And what is going to happen to my esophagus? It's going to deteriorate. And it's going to get cancer. Yeah. Right. So acid reflux can lead to esophageal cancer. Right. So you want to protect yourself from that. Right. So how do they detect esophageal cancer? Has anybody ever had that test done? Yeah, so they go, they do an endoscope. So they put a little scope down through your mouth and into your esophagus and they go down. And what they're doing is they're looking for precancerous cells at the margin where your esophagus enters into your stomach. Yeah. Now there is a problem sometimes with people having a defective sphincter here. And this is what is called a hiatal hernia. So when we think of a hernia, we think of like something protruding out the body wall. Like we think of like an abdominal hernia where you get damage to the abdominal wall, part of your intestine is poking out, right? This one, a hernia just means that it is protruding out, right? And the hiatal is, I think it's where the esophagus and the stomach meet. And so this is where the stomach is above the diaphragm. So just part of stomach. Part of stomach is above the diaphragm. This can sometimes happen um, with females when they're pregnant because the baby takes up so much space that it pushes the stomach up 
right? It makes it more difficult to breathe. They can also lead to the hiatal hernia, right? And then sometimes it just seems to be pre people get predisposed to it. Maybe it runs in a family. Um, so if we look at a diagram that shows that hiatal hernia, oops, there it is right here. So this is a diagram that shows the diaphragm. This is your esophagus, and this is your stomach. So notice just that a part of the stomach that is producing the acid extends above the diaphragm so that the acid can then easily get into the esophagus. And so that's one, one thing that they might um, give you acid reducers for. The other way that they treat this, which unfortunately doesn't tend to last, is as they go in and do surgery and they pull the stomach down and they try to kind of wrap muscles around there to keep the stomach from extending up in the diaphragm or up above the diaphragm. So you can have surgery to repair a hiatal hernia. Okay. So the next um, organ that we're gonna look at is the stomach. And the stomach has um, a function in that it stores food. And so it can store up to like two liters of fluid and food, about two liters. So if you did not have a stomach, you would not be able to eat a large meal, right? You would only be able to eat little bits of food all day long. So when people have their stomach stapled or when they have it a, a gastric bypass, or when they reduce the storage capacity using like, uh, like a belt around the stomach, they're just preventing themselves from eating large meals. But it doesn't mean that you can't eat a lot of calories over an extended period of time if you continually eat, okay? So it stores food and that's one of its main functions, yeah. Is there any truth to the stomach shrinking if you cut back? Like, yes, yeah, so it kind of shrinks up, yes. So it just becomes smaller and it's stored is so if you don't eat large foods, then its capacity shrinks. Yes. Yeah, there is some truth to that. Okay, the other function of the stomach is mechanical digestion. Because the stomach is also smooth muscle. And so it churns the food and mixes it with gastric juice. When this actually kind of starts by just seeing food. So I can see food, I can smell it, and then, then my stomach will start to churn, right? And that's because it's getting ready, right? It's also gonna start to produce enzymes. And so if I don't eat, I'm gonna have all those enzymes in my stomach, which have, kind of have nothing to do, with maybe some acid too. So um, that, that growling of your stomach is just, it's starting to churn in preparation for mechanical digestion and it growls because there's no food in it. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what happens when you don't eat and then like your stomach just continues to growl and like your body starts to accumulate fast? Like how does that entire- um, We'll talk about metabolism and yeah, and digestion and hunger but at, at the very end of the, the section. So probably not today. Okay, so it turns the food. When we mix gastric food with chyme, so gastric, oh sorry, gastric juice and food, when we mix it together, this is called chyme. So food plus gastric juice equals chyme. We also have chemical digestion in our stomach. So um, the chemical digestion breaks bonds between molecules. And so one way that we break bonds between molecules is by using hydrochloric acid, HCl. This is actually a very strong acid. So 
they can be like a pH 2 in your stomach. So this can actually break down and destroy microorganisms. So it can kill microbes and fungi. It can actually eat iron, right? Nails, it can break it down, right? So you can digest that, okay? You actually accidentally ingest it, okay? Um, the hydrochloric acid is especially important with meat digestion. Okay. So um, because I take an acid reducer and I don't eat a lot of meat, when I do eat meat, I have a really hard time digesting it. It feels like it stays in my stomach for a long period of time. Because what the hydrochloric acid does is it breaks down the connective tissue that holds the muscle. So it breaks down connective tissue and it denatures protein. So denaturation of protein just means that it unfolds the protein in preparation for enzymes getting to work. So this is denatures means to unfold. Right. So eating steak can be very painful for me to do. Yep. Yeah. Sometimes it can get um, digested, like if it's E. coli, so if it's a bacteria, sometimes the bacteria can get into the bloodstream and then it makes you sick. It actually, your um, medulla oblongata in your brain you can detect toxins and microbes in your body, and that is what causes you to vomit. Right, so it's detected that there's been an infection and invasion. Yeah, that's a good question. So not all microbes, and we'll talk about that in a second, because ulcers now are um, thought to be due to microbial infection. So not all microbes are a problem with hydrochloric acid. But I have to tell you that I got really sick in Costa Rica because I would had because I, I take these acid reducers, right? And my theory is is that. Um, I was less I was less protected from the bacteria and the food than the, my children or my husband. So my husband and children did not get sick at all. But I was like, every time I eat someplace, I'm vomiting, right? It was like, ah, oh, awful. Anyway, so maybe um, it has to do with the levels of hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Yeah. Okay. So that's chemical digestion. We also have a. Um, enzyme called pepsinogen. This is in its inactive state. So this is inactive. It is converted to pepsin in the presence of hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid converts pepsinogen to pepsin, and this is active. Pepsin is an enzyme, but it does not have the ACE ending, but it breaks down um, proteins by breaking the peptide bonds between amino acids. So hence why it is called pepsin, right? And all of a sudden I just saw that Pepsi in there. <laughs> they say if you have a, they say if you have stomach aches, you drink Pepsi and it, helps your stomach, but I'm not sure why. Yeah, also, I don't know if you've ever seen the videos where they take a chunk of meat and then put it in like Pepsi or like Coke, and it will go back and it will be gone. Digested, because it's acidic. Or it turns eggs to... Yeah, so it, is, so it is an acid, but that's because of the carbon dioxide, and that's because of the fizz. But I remember as a child that there used to be something about Pepsi, that they used to have sell syrup, I don't know. It just hit me. I don't know why that Pepsi, Pepsi, where that word came from. Maybe. It, yes, Pepto Bismol. Pepto Bismol is good for coating the stomach and um, uh, reducing um, acid indigestion. So this breaks the peptide bonds between amino acids. I'll have to look that up about Pepsi. Breaks peptide bonds 
between amino acids. Okay, so if pepsin digests protein, well, the stomach has protein in it, right? This lining of the stomach has protein in it. So this is probably why it comes first comes out as an inactive form, and then it becomes active. So this helps to prevent self-digestion. So that process prevents self-digestion, like the digestion of your, of your digestive tract, right? There's other, another mechanism, which is the mucous membrane. Does anybody remember what type of cells in the lining of the epithelial tissue actually produce mucus? Goblet cells, right? And the acid cannot eat through the mucous membrane. So as long as you have a healthy mucous membrane in your stomach, you will not tend to get ulcers. So when we talk about gastric ulcers, right, this is when you get sores in the stomach. And they can bleed, and they could be actually a source of anemia. So if you have too many stomach ulcers, you're bleeding out in your stomach, right? You could vomit the blood out also, but you're bleeding, and that could make you anemic because you keep having to produce more blood. So the sores in the stomach in the past, they said, oh, it is due to stress or it is due to diet. The diet probably does play some role in this uh, gastric ulcers because some things can make break down that mucous membrane and be absorbed directly across the surface of the stomach. So for example, alcohol. Okay, so the worst thing you can do for your mucous membrane is to go home after all day not eating or you know haven't eaten anything and you eat potato chips, drink a beer and, and take a couple of aspirin, right? Worst thing ever. <laughs> the total worst thing. So that's why they say don't drink alcohol on an empty stomach, right? If you eat first and then drink the alcohol, it's not going to do as much damage to the lining, right? And but, I mean, like, eat something that doesn't. Yeah, it's, it's not salt. potato chips or salty, right? Yeah. Yeah. Aspirin, yeah. aspirin just does make your blood, your, that's why they, so they stopped, they stopped, they said, don't, don't use aspirin for the longest time. Now aspirin is kind of coming back because it's supposedly good for your cardiovascular system. When I was a kid, that's, we didn't even have <coughs> ibuprofen or Tylenol. That's all we had is aspirin at home. Okay. But there is also a bacterial infection that could be the problem. And I said that most bacteria are, are killed by the acid, but there is a strain of bacteria called H. pylori. It's actually Helicobacter, Helicobacter pylori. So that's just the, species, the genus and the species name of a bacteria. This is resistant to acid. So it lives in your stomach. So now, if you ever have um, gastric ulcers for an extended period of time, and it, you know, it doesn't matter what you eat or how unstressed you become, um, they will do a test to see if you have H. pylori. And you don't really want it because these are really resistant to antibiotics. And so you end up taking antibiotics for like six months to get rid of this infection. It takes a lot of time to get rid of it. I think that they can even do a breath test. It used to be you can just they can test to see whether or not you have H pylori by doing a breath test. Yeah. Do gastric gastric ulcers like like my sister has when she can't eat spicy foods at all? Like how does do you know that? Um, spicy foods typically are not a problem because the spice in the food 
actually is not actually doing any damage to the tissues. It's just making your body think it is. But it might be that there's acid in there too. So it could be that. So maybe if she's eating salsa, it's tomato-based salsa, and yeah. it's probably the acid more than the spice. Because actually, for spiciness, like if you have if you have throat cancer, if you have mouth cancer, they actually give you cap capsaicin. They give you the spice in a in like a lozenge, lozenge, and it actually uh, capsaicin mimics tissue damage and pain. So you actually produce uh, endorphins. So it actually relieves the pain of it. So the pain part of it could actually be relieved by the capsaicin. Okay, so I think I have a picture of, yes. And so here's just a diagram showing the layer of the mucus and then the bacteria that are able to survive. Some people supposedly are carriers of H. pylori and never have a problem with it. So that's another weird thing is that some people have it, but it doesn't cause the ulcers. Some people have it and it does cause ulcers. Yeah. Yeah, and they also think that if they get into the blood, they also could lead to uh, cardiovascular disease, like uh, uh, blockage of blood vessels too. So they want to keep it out of your circulatory system. Okay, so I'm just going to stop there for today, and we'll start on the small intestine, and we'll finish up digestion on next Monday. So I will see you tomorrow for lab. Yeah, so I'm